So thanks everyone for being here today and thank you for bringing your laptops so you can follow along with what we're going to do. Um, so for my audience that's actually uh, my peer group from East Carolina University, part of the reason that we're in fact doing this particular topic today, uh, uh, let me give them a brief introduction. So we are sitting at Harriston Middle School. We're located in Greensboro, North Carolina. Our school is approximately 725 students in grades 6 through 8. Uh, eighth grade being our largest grade, I think it's somewhere in the order of 230 or somewhere in that ballpark. We are a transit community. We have students that are moving in and out of our school quite a bit. Uh, it's probably indicative of the population that we serve. The majority of our students are um, African American. We probably are 90% African American and the rest of the population are from, I think it's 12 other locations throughout the world. So we have quite a varied population of students, which poses some interesting challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's what we're in the business for. So just, that was a little bit of the background. So one of the other things that's interesting to note is that this past year is the third year of a grant that Guilford County Schools received from the United States government, the Department of Education, as part of No Child Left Behind. We have bought, uh, in the past two years, prior to 2016-2017 school year, we had bought Android tablets for all the middle school students. They were allowed to take them home. We had some interesting experiences with that, as you might expect. Um, and then this past year, that company, which was a company called Amplify, went out of business. They were actually bought out by Rupert Murdoch, and he decided he did not want to be in the hardware business, so instead he has sold off that company. So in 20, the summer of 2016, we took a different course of action and we have purchased for all of our students this little laptop from Lenovo. It's called the Yoga 11E. It's a Windows 10 machine. It's a very high-end functionality. It's a device that can actually become a tablet by folding the screen up and using the device as a tablet. Or, as you see, full functioning keyboard and becomes a laptop computer. So in terms of versatility, uh, this device actually has proven itself to be very effective. Now in addition to that, all of our students have the newest version of Office, Office 365. They have both the version that's on the PC as well as access to Office 365 online. So no matter where they are, if they had the device at home and they had Wi-Fi access, they actually had the ability to use Office 365 online, or if they're offline and don't have Wi-Fi access, then they can use Office sitting on their device. The second thing that Guilford County has done quite heavily, uh, particularly starting this year, is embrace the tool called Con uh, Canvas. It's a course management software product, and all of our teachers have been trained on that tool, and they develop their course content for each, each one of their classes. They're able to develop lesson plans. They develop assignments. Uh, the students were able to respond and return that information back to the teacher. That information then can be populated directly into Gradebook and therefore it can minimize the effect uh, of the work that generally teachers are involved in in getting their grades recorded. So for those people who have taken advantage of that in the classroom, those teachers, uh, and have really begun to use that tool and learn how to operate it, they are seeing quite a bit of reward from that. And we have several teachers that have become very proficient in using it. So 
the focus of my proposal for this organization, as you remember, by an email that I sent out in early February, was to less, let's maximize the benefit of this technology for our students and for you faculty members as well. And I proposed three different alternatives, and then I opened the floor up to you and said, if those alternatives aren't attractive and appealing to you, please provide me something that you think would benefit our students that would allow us to tap into this technology or any others that you could think of. And I would embrace that. But as it turns out, I got no feedback in terms of other projects that you folks were being interested in. So we're going to focus in on the voting of the three proposals that I made, and I will tell you that of the responses that I received back, the majority of the people made a selection of a particular topic that I'm going to talk about here in just a second. But let me just remind you what the three alternatives were. The first proposal that I made was um, let's maximize this device as a research tool because sitting on the device that you can probably see from the screen is a product called NC Wise Owl. And that is actually a tool that is available that the state of North Carolina has offered to all the schools in the state of North Carolina. And the powerful piece about that is they focus their attention at the three different uh, grade level breaks. So there's an elementary level break, a middle school break, and a high school break. And within each of those, we are able to focus in on a set of tools that would benefit students depending on which one of the populations that it serves. So in our case, obviously the middle school. And I'm going to go into that in just a moment because this proposal is actually the one that was selected by your voting efforts. Uh, so to remind you again, using this as a research tool and maximizing it by learning how to really use the product called NC Wise Owl. What I'm intending to do, as I'm going to tell you momentarily, is to offer our students a little handout that will summarize each of the features of NC Wise Owl, all the databases that are out there, and when and how to access them. And then I would build them a little study on how could I go about doing a research uh, project uh, focused on, I'm going to try to do one for each of the core curriculums, but I'm going to start off with science since that's my background and the thing that I can draw from quickly, and show them how they would go about using those particular databases inside of NC Wise Owl to do a, a research project. All of these, by the way, are going to meet various standards that we're going to talk about here in a moment. But again, let me remind you of the proposals. So I'm reiterating this. Proposal number one was called the laptop is a research tool. Let's see how it really works. Focusing on NC Wise Owl. Again, that was the one that received the most votes from this group. And so that's the one that I have opted to spend my efforts on. The second proposal was called bridging the information gap between Harrison Middle and the Greensboro Public Library. We basically don't have a strong relationship, and it's not just our school, it's in general, this is one of the problems that the literature is telling us as we go through this, that often we are sitting in our own little isolated islands, and yet our students may draw from each of those uh, places at any point in their academic career but we don't necessarily communicate strongly with one another to let, let's say, for example, the Greensboro Public Library and the, <clears throat> excuse me, and the branches that our students would particularly go to, and there are three of them, uh, they don't necessarily know what projects we're going to be working on, but if we had a stronger relationship, if we collaborated a little bit more with them and gave them a bit of a heads up about course content from each of our subject core subject areas that we're going to be focusing on, 
we could offer our students alternatives and that would be a way that we could bridge that gap. So that would have been what the second proposal was uh, that we didn't vote on. But it's not something that I'm going to say we're not going to do. It's something that I personally would like to see us do. And if I can find the time, we're going to start doing some of that. The third proposal was called a resource listing from the Greensboro Public Library branches that would help our students with their informational needs. So it sort of piggybacks on the second proposal, but what is actually meant by this particular one is to develop a little brochure, handout, canvas course, something that would be a tangible item that our students could then draw on when they had a big research project. And if we did not have the materials physically in this room, then we could offer them the alternative of going to one or more of the branches and letting them know in, for example, the main branch of the Greensboro Public Library, what and where would they go to find course material on this particular topic. Or if it were the Chavis branch, what did they have versus what did the main branch have. So again, this is another one that while we didn't vote on it, it is something that I do think would benefit the students and if I could find the time, I'm going to spend some time and effort to do that because I think it would benefit them. Not just at the middle school level, but what I'm intending for any of these projects to do is to enhance their middle school experience, but because I work at the high school that most of our kids will go to, Dudley, I know that when they reach the high school level, there's an absolute demand that's going to be made upon them to do a research project. It generally falls their senior year, but it builds from their freshman year on. And we offer courses, or Dudley offered courses, on how to do research. They stage it so that the kids get experience a little bit at a time. They learn how to use the reference tools like ours here. They have a bit broader selection at the high school level, obviously. And so they are introduced to the process and the tools. And if we were to get them acclimated stronger here, then I think it would just be a natural movement to learn even more of how that works at the high school. So again, something I would like to be able to do down the road. So, coming back to what we're here for, and that is to remind you that we have selected, based on voting democratically, we have selected the proposal number one, the laptop as a research tool, and now I'm going to focus my attention on this product called NC Wise Owl. So on all of the laptops, and if you look at your desktop of your particular device, you will see this icon that's called NC Wise Owl. And if you double click on it, it will open it up. Get it one more time. Double click it. Thank you you will see that it actually interfaces very quickly with the various levels of the grades that we're in. Or, if you were interested as a professional, they offer a link into some of the professional literature that can also benefit you in the classroom. It may be resources that focus on your particular subject area. It may be resources that talk about how to teach the kids uh, how to write in MLA st uh, style, how to cite references, etc. So, a lot of interesting tools that are available. But what we're going to do now is focus in on the middle school. So, we'll double click on that. And if you'll scroll that up a little bit, thank you. What you're going to see is all the alternatives that are available to our students. These are databases primarily that address particular areas or broad subject areas uh, that are dealt with, let's say, at the encyclopedia area. Uh, for example, Britannica is going to be one we're going to look at here in just a moment. Each one of these are free resources that, again, the state of North Carolina is paying for us to be able to use. 
and they really are powerful tools. They actually are more up-to-date than the tools we have in the media center, and the reason, of course, is because they're not out of print. Almost exclusively in the case of science, for sure, the minute you print a book, you're going to be out of date because something is going on constantly in the world of science, and we can't necessarily capture that information in print form quickly enough while on using the online versions, we are much more up to date because everything finds its way online first and they become the vehicle that creates the print form. So the fact that they can get these incredible tools is really such a benefit for them to do research with. NCYSAL, by the way, stands for North Carolina Online Windows for Learning. It is a subscription-based service and they pay quite a bit of money for this We've been paying for this tool since 1999 in the state of North Carolina. It's probably much more heavily used at the high school because when I was at Dudley, I sure saw them using it quite a bit. One of the many reasons that NCYS Owl is really much more beneficial for our students fall under a series of criteria that I just want to casually mention because I do think they are significant to know about. One of them is quality of information. It's information that's on the internet is often unreliable and as we well know from the politics of the moment, a lot of fake news is out there and there are a lot of fake resources out there. Many of them are an attempt to get you to pay to use their service but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that the information being provided by that particular vendor is as grand as some of the ones that we're going to be talking about here. In fact, often it's not. And moreover, most of the materials that are not controlled, I'm going to say controlled in quotes, that, is, that hasn't been really analyzed, sifted through, and looked at from a series of professionals who care about our kids, um, these tools, that has actually been done for. So anything that has found its way in NCYS Owl, a group of professionals have made the determination that these are products that would benefit our students and they are certainly products that will meet the social needs that we want our kids to be exposed to. Inside of all of these databases, they provide articles the full text articles and a lot of database services don't necessarily do that. What they offer you generally is the abstract and then they want you to pay to use the full text uh, of the article itself and some of those can be quite expensive. I know from the East Carolina experience we have that same benefit with the tools that we use online uh, off of the library on the campus at East Carolina, but and the same is true for other academic institutions. But if you do that just generally going online outside of the scope of a university, just using online services, some of those articles can cost you up to $100, particularly in the world of science. Uh, so it can be quite expensive where they're already paid for as part of the agreement that state of North Carolina has made with NCYS Owl organization. So direct articles from magazines, from online encyclopedias, from other reference sources and a variety of sources that are generally only available to paying customers in the examples I just cited uh, a while ago. The second reason that we would want to use this is just based on economy, based on the fact that by purchasing databases at the state level, because we have such a large population of users, the state is able to achieve economies of scale because they're able to lobby and negotiate best prices because of the sheer number of people that might draw and use that particular source. So the vendors of those materials are much more readily um, in a position to work with the state and the state then can provide that to our students which again is a huge cost savings for us as uh, consumers. 
Perhaps the single most important reason for using these tools is the safety question. Because the World Wide Web, as we probably know, was never intended to be a K-12 education resource tool. And as we all know from our own experiences using this, if you pose a Google query or a Bing query or a Yahoo query or whatever search engine you use, you very likely are going to find yourself meeting some content that might not be something you would want your children to look at and not that we would want our kids to look at either. We already know we have enough trouble keeping them off the gaming systems with these laptops. But even worse are some of the videos that I have seen, music videos, uh, and even more than that, some of the porn sites that can find their way masked as something legit when in reality they're not. But because of the safety issue that is surrounding these particular products, we can be assured that those professionals that have gleaned the, the positive information and applied it into here have pulled all of that stuff out of the way. We don't see any advertised content and nothing that's not age appropriate for this group of students. Finally, they offer them tools to help them use each one of these products that we're going to take a brief cursory look at. And we're going to move there now. We're going to start with something called Britannica School. By the way, just to mention this, if our students have their device at home, when they use these products, it actually requires a password. And every year, Guilford County Schools slash the state of North Carolina, I'm not sure which one it is, I think it's the state, alter that password and we can provide that to our students. They, students can use as they do their research paper. Okay, so coming back now, this is the set of tools that I now want to help our students be able to use. And again, my proposal is going to be that as time now goes on, I'm going to put together for them a little brochure, handout, something cheat sheet, that will summarize in terse words, not as long-winded as I've been in this uh, publication that I'm doing here, but just to cite for them what this stuff is about. Let them have that and walk around with it. Let them take it to the high school. Let them keep on using it from 6th through 7th through 8th here and really take advantage of that. So this is, in a nutshell, what you voted to help me do for our students and for you, uh, the teachers in the group. So. I hope that you see that there's benefit to be gained from this. We will be moving ahead very quickly now to put all of this stuff together and to make sure that it meets the needs of our students. One of the things I have done, and I'll just briefly mention this because my video needs to reflect this, I've done a bunch of deep research around the use of technology in education and our students really have an advantage with this particular tool. A lot of the research has basically said directly that students coming out of poverty areas, like many of our students are, can actually get a jump start and overcome some of those obstacles by having access to tools such as these that I'm now described and with a device like this one. So with all of these things in mind, John Keene, for example, one of the delegated deputies of the Department of Education basically says the following, that through collaboration, a robust infrastructure and personalized learning, future ready district leaders are shaping the vision of how technology can transform learning for all students. It is my opinion that our Guilford County Schools leadership has, in fact, done a good job of that. 
they have for three years running embraced the integration of technology into the schools. And the focus, of course, has been, as you know, the middle school. Uh, I don't know what the present plan is for the grant. The grant will expire in December. I don't know if they're planning to revisit and to try to resubmit a grant so they could move on into uh, providing these devices for high school level or elementary or where they might go. Hopefully they will. I really do hope they pursue it for the high school because I think it's incredible that our kids have this tool, but the minute they graduate from us and head off to the high school, they don't have this available to them as freely as they did while they were here or at any of the other middle schools in Guilford County. What they will have is what we traditionally have in our computer labs, the desktop devices, and they'll have to come before or after class, during lunch, or when classrooms come in together. Whereas with this device, it's on 24-7 if they take it home uh, and have access to Wi-Fi. So anyway, uh, they do have this information. Publisher uh, Ashley Wainwright, who's a marketing coordinator with a company called Secure Edge Network, has listed 10 significant reasons why students need, and that's in capital letters, technology in the classroom. Her proposal is that every student would benefit, and irregardless of socioeconomic status, irregardless of any other criteria, technology sort of becomes the leveling field for all students because once they have a tool like this in their possession and with the knowledge of how to use things such as NCY's OWL, everybody then is on an equal par. And that's one of many reasons that she thinks sooner versus later that the devices ought to be made available in the classroom. And for you teachers, her opinion is that you benefit because you are able to embrace the use of the technology in your curriculum. You're able to construct class materials around that, and obviously using Canvas, you're doing that now. So it's just one more uh, backup to the belief that, in fact, the technology can serve our students better. Uh, Jonathan Becker presents a compelling finding in his research entitled Digital Equity in Education, a multi-level examination of differences in relationships between computer access, computer use, and state-level technology policies. Basically, Becker is saying that in many rural schools where the majority of those students are African Americans or underprivileged students, they, in the past, have been less likely to have access to computers. Thank goodness Guilford County has come over that hurdle and we have afforded our students with the technology. And basically Becker says that for those locations where that has occurred, generally speaking, performance has gone up, test scores have gone up, and use of information has gone up. It increased circulation in some libraries, in others it didn't, and ours might be one of those cases because students are finding now with the art books and with e-books and with online capabilities that unless they need a series, which we happen to have in this room, they don't value the need to come in here anymore. So one of my tasks and challenges is convincing them they need to come in more. And that's a struggle that I'm really grappling with right at the moment. And I'm not alone. A lot of librarians across uh, the state of North Carolina are saying similar things. Certainly in Guilford County because we're all facing this technology. But it is important, as Becker points out, that our students be given all the access that they can. Let's see. Um, Purdue University School of Education, they have an online program called uh, Learning Design and Technology. It's a master's program and they pose some very interesting perspectives to challenge 
prospective graduate applicants. And one of the things that they say is the following. A 14th century illustration by Lorenzus di Volinia depicts a university lecture in medieval Italy. It's a painting. The teacher lectures from a podium, not unlike me, at the front of a room while the student sits in rows and listen. For those of us who went to school in the 50s and 60s, that was our model. We had a talking head. And for me, by the way, as a teacher, that has been a struggle that I've had. Now, you know that that is definitely not the way that we go about our teaching because our students look bored. They are bored and they're restless and after a few minutes they're ready to move around. But with the newer technologies, as Purdue says, students are now able to not only move about but to collaborate and work together in teams. This is, I think, something that I don't ever remember doing when I was in school and it's very commonplace for our students to do that now. Technology is one of the, the aids to do that. And they stress that very point. And that's the focus of their master's program. How do we integrate that technology, move those students around, and make sure that everybody's engaged? Farbury and Hicks in Colorado present a perspective that warns the educational community that inclusion of technology in the classroom might have a false perception. They state that many government, sorry, many government and business leaders believe that technology thoughtfully integrated into the curriculum will provide students with skills necessary to complete and survive in the 21st century. End of subject. But you and I know that isn't true. That's only a piece of the puzzle. They still need the skills that they, you want them to have, that you are teaching to them on a day-to-day -day basis. This is but a tool. It's no different than when I fought, bought my first slide rule. Yes, slide rule. <laughs> I still have that sucker. I have two of them. I have a round one and a linear one. But it was a device that I could use in math. This is the device we can use in everything. But it is not the end all and be all. And this is the point that Farby and Hicks are making. This is not the final solution, but one piece of the puzzle. And that, I think, is part of our challenge as educators. How do we engage them with this and engage them also with the traditional learning that they need to take advantage of in the classroom? Okay, summing up. I do want to mention standards because one of the things that this project is intended to do is to embrace the standards. And if I were to just pick an example of something that would let me use multiples of these, and I'm going to do that, uh, what I'm going to try to do is to show through the definition of the lesson that I would develop, and I'm going to try to do this through Canvas, a science experiment or a science research task, one of the things I've been flirting with is have the students to research the following question. Where do carniv carnivorous plants live in the United States? I want them to know what carnivorous, carnivorous plants, I can say that word originally, carnivorous plants what are they? How are they different from regular, traditional plants? Where might we find them? And I purposely chose that because North Carolina is one of those unique places, I know you science folks know this, one of those unique places where we have multiple carnivorous plants on the eastern part of our state. So part of what I would give them as an assignment would be to develop for me a map and to pinpoint where those particular plants were. I want them to tell me the counties. So I want them to be succinct and exact. And using these places, I can find that information. I can put it on a map and I could show you that in 
you have New Hanover County, Cumberland County, and all those points east of Guilford County, there are three or four species of carnivorous plants. Some are about to go on the endangered species list that's going to go away in the current Trump administration, but those plants are still going to be stressed, whether that list exists or not, because people are poaching them and they're selling them on the open market. And while it's against the law, they're still doing it. So I want them to understand those plants because they're very interesting and they're very unique. And the science community has started looking at them a bit more seriously in recent research that I saw in the last uh, year. I want, them, I want our students to appreciate that too. So we could cover a bit about mathematics. I'll have them do some calculations. Geography, where do they grow? Like I say, North Carolina is a prevalent place, but we're not the only state, but we're the biggest state that have these particular organisms. And then to write something cohesive around that and work together in teams to talk about them. So I would try to embrace a number of the curriculum standards, and one of those would be SI1, which is Sources of Information, TT1, which is the technology as a tool. I want to tell us what databases they use. If they use resources in the media center, I want to know that too. RP1, the research process, I want us to find out. I want them to tell us what is the process that they use. W7.7, to conduct sh a short research project to answer a specific question, drawing from several resources and generating addition additional related questions for future research. I want them to see this opens some additional questions. For example, if they live in North Carolina, why do they live here? What conditions prompt them from being so prolific, I'm going to say prolific, on the coast of North Carolina. There are reasons for that, and I want them to understand that. It has to do with soils, it has to do with the plant communities they exist in, etc. Standard W7A, they gather relevant information from multiple print digital sources using search terms efficiently. That's what this really lets them do. W7A, they quote, paraphrase the data while avoiding plagiarism and following standard citation formatting. Those things we talked about coming from those two databases. W7-9, they draw evidence from literary, literary, literary or informational text to support, analyze, and do reflection and research. WCCR6, they use technology including, including the internet to produce and publish writing and to interact and collaborate with each other and that would be a part of that project. And then the final thing is W76, they use technology including the internet to produce and publish writing and they link to and cite sources as well as to interact and collaborate with each other including linking to and citing sources. So I think that we have a great opportunity and I appreciate that your voting chose this topic which is actually, I hate to admit this, was the one I wanted to do the most first. I think it opens a lot of avenues, a lot of doors. Hopefully it would help you in the classroom. Hopefully our students would benefit, and that's sort of the summarization of where we were and now where we are and what I'm headed to do. So thank you for your time today, and that concludes my presentation.